This video will review the pathophysiology of depression in general, and specifically will focus on major depressive disorder, which is the most common subtype of depression. Major depressive disorder, or MDD, is an affective disorder characterized by depressed mood, which is feelings of dejectedness, lack of hope, or sadness, and or loss of interest or pleasure in almost all activities. Loss of interest or pleasure is also termed anhedonia. Major depressive disorder is considered an affective disorder because it affects what is known as affect. This is defined as the external expression of emotional content. Um, on the other hand, mood is the internal emotional state of an individual. Said another way, mood is the internal emotional state, whereas affect is the external expression of that emotional state. Another way to think about this is that mood is a symptom, whereas affect or affective is the way that the disease or disorder is expressed externally. In general, the rate of major depressive disorder has and continues to increase among the population. Interestingly, there is not a difference between high income countries and low and middle income countries in the rates of depression. As demonstrated in this graphic, both high and low income countries experience high prevalence of depression at varying rates. In the US, this is about 8% of the population over a 12 month period. In fact, lifetime incidence of major depressive disorder is on the order of 10 to 15% in men and 20 to 25% in women. In other words, one in five individuals will experience at least one depressive episode in their lifetime. Depression may occur at any age, even among children and the elderly, although the average age of onset is the late 20s. Depression is common in children and adolescents, up to 20% in some age groups, and suicide is the second leading cause of death among individuals aged 10 to 34. We'll talk about this risk of suicide a bit more when we get to the antidepressants themselves. In terms of etiology, major depressive disorder is considered a genome environment interaction disease because both genes and the environment contribute to the expression of the disorder. Depressive disorder and suicide does tend to occur in families. The first degree relatives of patients with depression are anywhere from one and a half to three times more likely to develop depression themselves. And the overall heritability of depression is estimated at 37%. That is what contributes to the genetic factors. On the other hand, the remaining 63% of disease variability is due to the individual environment and individual experiences. And this can include both aversive and protective factors. Aversive factors are things like prenatal influences, childhood trauma, stress, medical illness, and drug abuse. Protective factors include social support, coping, and exercise. Together, genes and the environment interact to lead to the expression of major depressive disorder at the behavioral level, brain network level, and the molecular level. We will now spend several minutes talking about the pathophysiology, which is the molecular and brain network level of the disease. And we'll round out this video by discussing the clinical presentation, which is the behavioral level of major depressive disorder. There are two primary hypotheses for the development of major depressive disorder. The first is called the monoamine hypothesis, also sometimes called the biogenic amine hypothesis. In this hypothesis, it is stated that depression is caused by decreased brain levels of the monoamine neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. It is important to note that these monoamine systems do not function separately from one another, but are likely interdependent. And that is why decreased brain levels of all three neurotransmitters is required for the expression of depression. This hypothesis came about in the 1950s when it was noticed 
that a drug that caused depletion of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine levels actually led to depression in many patients. This drug is called reserpine, which was previously used as an antihypertensive, but is no longer used as such due to significant side effects, such as the production of depression. The fact that depletion of these neurotransmitters led to depression then led to the hypothesis that perhaps increasing levels of these neurotransmitters would reverse depressive symptoms. And this is supported by the fact that the mechanism of action of almost all antidepressant drugs is to increase concentrations of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine in the brain. The problem with this hypothesis of depression is that even though antidepressant drugs increase monoamine neurotransmitters immediately, it often takes several weeks for these drugs to have an effect. And so clearly there must be something else going on that results in the long delay between initiation of therapy and effectiveness being observed by the patient. The explanation for this long delay is involves neuroplasticity and network uh, dysregulation. This variation of the hypothesis suggests that it's not just the levels of the monoamine neurotransmitters that are important, rather it is their regulation that is important in overall health and functioning. And that in depression, the monoamine neurotransmitter regulatory system becomes inefficient or said another way, these neurotransmitters become dysregulated. And what the antidepressant drugs are actually doing, in addition to increasing the concentrations of these neurotransmitters, is restoring efficient regulation. And again, the support for this hypothesis is the fact that drugs increase neurotransmitters immediately, but their full effects are often delayed by several weeks. And it does typically take several weeks for the dysregulation to be reversed by antidepressant drugs. The reason it takes so long for this effect is that gene transcription is involved and changes due to gene transcription typically take several days or weeks to be realized. In the case of antidepressants, it is thought that activity at receptors and transporters leads to changes in gene transcription, which then leads to downregulation of presynaptic feedback me mechanisms for norepinephrine and serotonin, and this the then leads to neuroplasticity changes that finally reverse or reduce the symptoms of depression. The second primary hypothesis for the production of depression is the neurotrophic hypothesis. This hypothesis involves both stress hormone signaling involving cortisol and neurotrophic factor signaling, including brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. In this hypothesis, over time, inflammatory factors in the brain and overexcitation or overstimulation of neuronal activity lead to a decrease in the formation of new neurons in the brain, also called neurogenesis. Also contributing to the pathophysiology is that whenever there is stress, cortisol is released. This is a normal response to stress, but in situations where cortisol release is not reversed, or said another way, the brain becomes unable to suppress cortisol release following the resolution of stress, this also leads to a decrease in neurogenesis because of the increased circulating levels of cortisol. The reason this hypothesis is relevant is that most antidepressant drugs either prevent or reverse the damage caused by increased cortisol release, overexcitation, and inflammation. Also, electroconvulsive therapy, which is one possible adjunctive therapy for depression, will prevent or reverse the effects of cortisol and overexcitation. The factor linking cortisol and stress to decreased neurogenesis is thought to be BDNF. BDNF is a neurotrophic factor that normally stimulates dendritic sprouting and new neuron growth. And following long-term elevation of cortisol, BDNF is decreased. Antidepressants are thought to reverse this effect by increasing BDNF levels.
In addition to the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or HPA axis and the release of cortisol, there are additional neuroendocrine factors that are at play in this hypothesis. These other factors include steroids, endogenous steroids like uh, progesterone derivative allopregnanolone. And the reason for the inclusion of allopregnanolone in this hypothesis is that chronic stress and depression are known to be associated with decreased allopregnanolone. There's also a rapid decrease in this hormone following labor and delivery, which could contribute to the development of postpartum depression specifically. Thyroid hormone is another neuroendocrine factor that can contribute to the expression of depression. The main evidence for this is that hypothyroidism or reduced thyroid hormone is a cause of secondary depression. In summary, there are many factors that contribute to the pathophysiology of major depressive disorder. Even though I presented to you two different hypotheses, these hypotheses are not mutually exclusive, and the true pathophysiology of major depressive disorder is likely a combination of all of the factors that I've listed for you previously. Said another way, both the monoamine hypothesis and the neurotrophic hypothesis are correct. Factors such as the immune system, the HPA axis in cortisol signaling, autonomic nervous system function, which includes catecholamine and monoamine neurotransmitters, contribute to the development of CNS dysfunction, like altered neurotransmission, reduced plasticity, and impaired neurogenesis. These changes are what then eventually lead to the alterations in emotion, cognition, and behavior that are characteristic of major depressive disorder. Not surprisingly, these immune, HPA, and autonomic changes also increase cardiovascular and metabolic risk, which is not surprising given that cardiovascular and metabolic dysfunction are often comorbid with depression. In summary, all of these systems are working together in concert to control many systems and functions in the body. When any combination of these systems becomes dysregulated, that can lead to changes in dysfunction both peripherally in the cardiovascular and metabolic system and centrally in the brain, which can contribute to the development of depression as well as other comorbidities. In major depressive disorder, depressive episodes frequently follow some kind of psychosocial stressor. The initial depressive episode might follow the death of a loved one, marital separation or divorce, loss of a job, or some kind of physical or emotional trauma. Over 50% of patients have more than one episode, which means that recurrence of depressive episodes is very high. The onset of depression is usually gradual, but it can be abrupt. And it's typically episodic, meaning depressive episodes do come and go on their own, but these episodes are rather unpredictable, and in, in one individual might last multiple days, whereas in another individual, they last multiple months. And therefore, both the clinical presentation and the treatment of depression are highly individualized. Major depressive disorder is diagnosed using the DSM-5 criteria for MDD. This criteria is shown in the table on the left. For major depressive disorder, there has to be at least one depressive ep episode without a history of mania or hypomania. Mania is more characteristic of bipolar disorder, and we will discuss mania in greater detail in that unit. For now, just know that the DSM criteria for depression exclude a history of mania or hypomania. An individual who qualifies for the diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder needs to have five or more of the nine symptoms listed in the same two-week period. To summarize, five or more symptoms nearly every day for a two-week period. In addition, at least one of this, those five symptoms must be either depressed mood or anhedonia. A patient can have both depressed mood and anhedonia, but at least one of those two must be present for a diagnosis of MDD to be made. Another important thing to note is that in children and adolescents, rather than having a depressed mood, 
they may actually exhibit a more irritable or agitated mood. And that is common of depression in children and adolescents. The other possible symptoms of depression include change in weight or appetite, either up or down, insomnia or hypersomnia, so sleep can go up or down as well, psychomotor retardation, which is slowed movement, speech, and thought, or psychomotor agitation, which is restlessness and agitation. This is commonly associated with loss of energy or fatigue, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, impaired concentration, and thoughts of death or suicidal ideation or possibly suicide attempt. The graphic on the right depicts the DSM-5 criteria in pictorial format. You can see the fundamental symptoms where at least one of the two must be present for a diagnosis, either depressed mood or anhedonia. Over a two week period, at least five or more of the nine symptoms must be present nearly every day. Those additional symptoms are listed in order of how much cumulative functional impairment is produced. So whereas depressed mood, anhedonia, feelings of worthlessness, et cetera, may not lead to much functional impairment, on the other end of the spectrum, psychomotor retardation or agitation can lead to significant functional impairment in day-to-day -day activities. The symptoms of depression are divided into three main groups, the emotional symptoms, the neurovegetative symptoms, and the neurocognitive symptoms. And that is also depicted in the figure here. What you can see is that with emotional symptoms only, impairment is low. As you add the neurovegetative and eventually the neurocognitive symptoms, functional impairment can be very high. Although I won't spend much time on this, I also want to mention that there are several specifiers that can be identified when a diagnosis of major depressive disorder is made. These specifiers include things like the illness pattern, various clinical features like the presence of anxiety or psychosis, the severity, the onset, and the remission status. These are all specifiers that would be identified with a specific ICD code and may dictate some aspects of therapy and treatment. As I said, I won't go into detail about each of these here, but I wanted to at least present them to you because they may guide therapy in some instances. Patient assessment in major depressive disorder includes additional tests to rule out other conditions and medications that could cause depression. A physical exam would be important to conduct a mental status exam to determine the level of cognitive functioning of the individual, as well as a basic lab workup. And the main thing to look for in a basic lab workup would be thyroid hormone levels to determine whether or not that might be underlying the depressive symptoms. In addition, other illnesses must be ruled out, um, such as metabolic issues, cardiovascular issues, or even potentially an infection that could be contributing to the symptoms. The next thing to conduct would be depression rating scales. The Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, or HAMD, and the Patient Health Questionnaire 9, or PHQ-9, are probably the two most common depression scales that our patients self-reported and determine the severity of the depressive symptoms. In terms of disease history, a background of certain disease states can increase the risk of depression or can underlie the formation of depression. And these include diseases like stroke, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury, and hypothyroidism, as I mentioned previously. If an underlying disease is present, that disease would also need to be treated concurrently with any depression treatment. There are various medications that can contribute to the expression of depressive symptoms. Such medications include isotretinoin, some of the anticonvulsants, the beta blockers, especially propranolol, steroids, and varenicline. A patient who is taking any of those medications could be exhibiting depressive symptoms because of their medication. And finally, it's important to evaluate the risk of suicidal ideation. Unfortunately, approximately 10 to 15% of depressed patients do complete suicide. 
and therefore it's important to assess individuals who are depressed for suicidal thoughts. And the most common way of doing that is the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Factors that are associated with increased risk of suicide and suicidal ideation are the presence of other psychiatric disease like anxiety or psychosis, coexisting substance use disorder, younger age, any sort of physical illness, recent stressful event, childhood trauma, and male gender. Patients who have specific plans that are violent and irreversible for committing suicide are considered to have suicidal intent. And it's important to note, and I'll say this again, that the risk of suicide actually increases during initial treatment with an antidepressant. And we'll talk about the reasons for that when I introduce the antidepressants as a drug class. Major depressive disorder can significantly limit psychosocial functioning and does diminish quality of life. It also increases the risk of several other disease states such as heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cognitive impairment, cancer, as well as other disabilities. However, evidence-based guidelines for the treatment of depression as well as effective therapeutics do exist. And this is a good thing because some other psychiatric conditions do not have very good evidence-based guidelines to guide treatment. And for that reason, there should be a way to effectively treat patients with major depressive disorder and reduce the symptoms of this debilitating disease state. For more information about major depressive disorder, also called clinical depression, snap a pic of the QR code to access a 10-minute explainer video about depression. <laughs>